consulting the committee of the whole to welcome the players of Team Canada 1972. Please take your seats. So, okay, this is kind of a...
It is my pleasure today to welcome to the House of Commons players and representatives of the Team Canada Team 1972. I will ask members to hold their applause until I have the names of our guests. I'm wondering if I even need to go through this because everybody knows exactly who you are, but I'm going to take it from the top if everyone can hold back. Don Ari. Yvan Cornoyer. Yvan Cornoyer. The Honorable Ken Dryden. Ron Ellis. For Victor Hadfield, who was not able to attend, his son, Jeff Hadfield. Paul Henderson. Dennis Hall. The Honorable Frank Mahavlich. Peter Mahavlich. Serge Savard. Robert Sealing. And the late Bill White, represented by his son, Cam White. I will now invite the Right Honourable Prime Minister to make a statement to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the 1972 Summit Series. Mr. Speaker, Everyone loves a good comeback story, especially one that united our whole country. Quite frankly, the level of unanimity in this house today is a nice thing to see, too. <laughs> Fifty years ago, before the Summit Series had even started, a lot of sports writers and hockey fans were predicting an easy win for Team Canada. At the time, a journalist of the Globe and Mail famously promised that if the Soviets won a single game, he would eat his own column shredded in a bowl of borscht. Well, it didn't take long for him to eat his words literally. There's even a picture of it. Le 2 septembre 1972, le premier match a eu lieu au Forum de Montréal. Le Canada perd 7 à 3. Au cours des jours et semaines qui ont suivi, notre équipe a vécu des hauts et des bas. Après une défaite lors du cinquième match à Moscou, on était au pied du mur. Si on voulait gagner la série, il fallait gagner les trois dernières parties d'affilée. C'est tout un défi. Mais les joueurs ont continué de s'entraîner, les entraîneurs ont peaufiné leur stratégie et les Canadiens n'ont pas perdu espoir. Game 6. After a scoreless first period, Canada finally produces a 3-2 victory. Game 7, Phil Esposito scores the first two goals, and Canada wins 4-3, and then Game 8. Dernier match de la série, il reste une minute à jouer, et le pointage est de 5 à 5. C'est là que Paul Henderson. So, Henderson rushes to the net. He falls. He gets back up. Team Canada takes two rebound shots, and with 34 seconds to go, Henderson flips in a shot to the goalie's left. You could hear the cheers from coast to coast to coast. <laughs> Everyone remembers where they are. 
everyone except me, because I was only nine months old. Uh, <laughs> but I remember growing up with players like Yvonne Cornoyer and Ken Dryden as heroes. I'm even wearing my Habs socks today. <laughs> they weren't only heroes because they had won the series. They were all heroes because they taught us a lesson. They showed us how grit and hard work pays off. They showed us that even when there's only 34 seconds left to play, you never give up. And in a global example, they showed us that having a hard-fought competition on ice can go a long way even for diplomacy. Mr. Speaker, Paul Henderson once told the story of a friend calling him when the Berlin Wall fell, saying that after his famous goal in 72, the Soviets probably never recovered. <laughs> Now, I will let experts debate on whether there's any truth to that. But what is absolutely true is that the Summit Series was a defining moment in the history of our country. Here, here. Monsieur le Président, en 1972, notre drapeau, l'unifolier, avait seulement sept ans. C'est un drapeau, à l'époque, qui ne faisait pas encore l'unanimité. Mais comme le souvent fait remarquer Serge Savard, Après la victoire de nos joueurs qui portaient cette feuille d'érable sur leur chandail, les Canadiens sont devenus fiers de ce symbole qui les représente encore aujourd'hui, un symbole de paix, de démocratie et de liberté. Our world is a different place today than it was during the Cold War, Mr. Speaker, but there are parallels. And one thing remains the same. We will never stop fighting for what is right. Today, as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Summit Series and all the members of this historic team, let's remember the best of who we are as Canadians. Let's continue our work to make sure people, young and old, players and fans, can be part of this extraordinary sp sport in a safe and respectful environment Let's keep reminding the world that being polite and friendly never precludes us also being tough and determined. And let's remember that with hope and hard work, there's nothing we can't overcome. Merci, Monsieur. Merci, Monsieur. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Quel honneur d'avoir parmi nous aujourd'hui les grands héros légendaires de la série du siècle. It's an honour to welcome to the House today members of the Team Canada from 50, at the 50-year anniversary of their victory at the Soviet, over the Soviet national team in the 72 Summit Series. 1972 was the year that the Cold War spilled into the, into the world of sports. In July, American and world's chess champion Bobby Fischer had defeated the Soviet champion and number two world competitor Bobby, uh, excuse me, Boris Spassky. And in the Munich Olympics, the American basketball team had lost a bitter and still contested gold medal game against the Soviet Union. But neither of these events produced such drama or lasting glory as the Summit Series. The series pitted, for the first time, the best Canadian professionals, uh, although some of them look too young to have been there, um, against the Soviet players, who were at the time underestimated, but preparing quietly for a surprise. It was to be the true test of hockey supremacy, played under the shadow of a much deadlier contest for global supremacy. The Canadian Ministry of External Affairs suggested that the encounter could be called a friendship series. Thank goodness uh, the players ignored that and had the good sense <laughs> to compete fiercely. Although most commentators and most Canadians expected the series uh, to be an easy one, after a shocking 7-3 loss in Game 1 in Montreal, it became clear that the series would not be a, uh, a friendly exhibition of Canada's superiority. As the losses mounted, the pressure on our players grew, the low point being the series as Game 4 in Vancouver, when some of the crowd rained booze down on their defeated heroes. Canadians simply couldn't understand 
how these NHL all-stars, these legendary names that they knew so well, could be outscored by a team of Russian amateurs. The Canadian fans had not yet realized what had become clear to the Canadian players. These Russians were actually really good. They were playing a different game than the NHLers were used to. A game of speed and finesse, long lead breakout passes, and pinpoint cross-ice accuracy. By the end of the series, the names of those faceless Russians would be household names in Canada. Uh, we know them now, we, know, we knew them then, and now many of them play in the leagues on this side of the ocean, uh, or at least their, 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 their children and grandchildren now do. Names and faces the Canadians would come to know and respect in international tournaments and uh, in exhibitions pit, pitting Soviets against NHL competitors. By the time the Canadian team left to train in Europe ahead of the four games in Moscow, the idea of a friendship series was long dead. From this side of the Cold War, knowing how it ends, we can afford to look back objectively. But in the moment and at the, at the time, the series had become to borrow the uh, name of the 40th anniversary documentary, The Cold War on Ice. The 72 series was the first time the term Team Canada was applied to a Canadian hockey team. In the minds of Canadians and fans following the series around the world and on both sides of the Iron Curtain, Team Canada versus Team Russia had become us versus them. Two styles, two different ways of life, two fundamentally incompatible ideologies and system of, gov and gov of government. Democracy versus totalitarianism, Communism versus free enterprise, freedom versus repression. Clichés never tell the whole story, but they often tell the most important part. This is true of the stories we are told today of the 72 series. Before the series, we told ourselves that we were the best hockey country in the world and that our way of playing was the only way to play properly. During the series, we realized that this wasn't quite true. For, the, for having lost those four games and having seen the competitive grit and the finesse of a, of a team of a different style, we learned that we needed to up our game. In the last game on home ice, the frustration of Canadian fans in Vancouver's Pacific Coliseum erupted as boos rained down on, from the bleachers. Team Canada lost, falling 4-2. to two. In a now iconic post-game interview, the legendary El Esposito pleaded with Canadians to quote the elder Esposito brother. He said, I am completely disappointed. I can't believe it. Some of our guys are really, really down in the dumps. We know. We're trying. They got a good team. Let's face the facts. But it doesn't mean we're not giving 150% because we are. Every one of us, every one of the guys, 35 guys that came out and played for Team Canada, we did it because we love our country. But on foreign ice, in front of hostile fans, with their backs against the wall, down two games, Team Canada rallied to win the last three games, each by a single goal. Each of those winning goals was scored by the great Paul Henderson. <laughs> His name is immortalized uh, in Frank uh, Hewitt's frantic play-by-play -play call that erupted through thousands, actually hundreds of thousands, and probably millions of televisions and radios in classrooms and workplaces across the country. Henderson has scored, and the crowd goes wild, of course. Ladies and gentlemen in the audience would not have been so pleased, of course, but those here on the other side of the world would have applauded and cheered with such a vibrating and powerful force that it would have been whole, heard all around the globe. It's a call that still thrills us all half a century later, even those of us who were born after 1972, <laughs> who have only heard the echo of those cheers, still revel in the legacy that they represent. 
Uh, well, when we hear those calls and we see those names, the names that are here today, Yvonne Cornoyer after the winning goal, for example, it takes us back to a different time and a different world. It was 17 years before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, just a few months before the wall fell in May of 1989, a 20-year-old Alexander McGilney would become the first Soviet star to defect to the West to play in the NHL. He was charged with deserting the Soviet Red Army, in which he was nominally an officer. Shortly after that, a crumbling and cash-strapped Soviet hockey system and Soviet Union would come crashing down as well. Two years after that, in 1991, the Soviet Union, which in 1972 had appeared almost invincible, officially came to an end. I say almost invincible because this Team Canada showed that they were anything but. That, that is something that the Canadian spirit uh, brings alive in hockey, but also in all aspects of our lives. I think what is so special about the gentlemen gathered here today is that every single Canadian can see their own triumph in this legendary win. You've made us all proud. You've given us one of the defining moments of Canadian history. In fact, I think if any Canadian were asked to close their eyes and dream up the most Canadian moment, it would be hard to think of anything more Canadian than the 72 Summit Series victory. And so on behalf of all Canadians, I wish you a great congratulations and I thank you for your contribution to our national story and may we all live up to your incredible example of grit and determination and victory. Thank you. Honorable député de Belleuil Chambly. Monsieur le Président, Messieurs, je peux me vanter d'être le seul chef de parti en cette Chambre à avoir chaussé des patins avant 1972. <rire> Avec bien peu de succès, comme vous constatez, j'ai très mal viré. Vous le savez, le Bloc québécois a toujours défendu l'identité québécoise. Le Québec et le Canada sont deux nations différentes avec des valeurs et souvent des façons de faire différentes. Nous, nous défendons le droit de vivre en français, la langue commune et officielle de la nation québécoise, parfois même dans certaines chambres des joueurs. Nous ne nous reconnaissons pas dans le multiculturalisme. La monarchie britannique, on passe. Autre sujet. Nous, on aime les dynasties seulement au hockey. <rires> Nous avons le Code civil, nous prisons l'énergie propre, nous sommes attachés à la laïcité. Nous sommes différents, deux nations différentes, mais on se rejoint tout de même de temps en temps. On partage souvent des intérêts et des visions communes. Le Canada et le Québec sont pacifiques. Nous préférons la paix à la guerre, le dialogue à l'utilisation des armes. Nous sommes démocrates. Nous sommes préoccupés par la pauvreté, l'injustice ou la violence et nous cherchons des solutions pour améliorer la vie des gens. Je pense franchement que les Canadiens et les Québécois sont du bien bon monde. Et surtout, ce que nous partageons, Québécois et Canadiens, c'est la conviction sans faille que le hockey est le plus beau sport au monde. Bertho Blake à Maurice Richard, à Sidney Crosby et Marc-André Fleury, en passant, bien sûr, par l'énorme Guy Lafleur, Mike Bossier, Doug Gilmore, les Canadiens et les Québécois sont sans l'ombre d'un doute. Puis on, on se parle entre nous ici, je ne veux pas avoir l'air prétentieux, mais les meilleurs joueurs de hockey au monde. Je pousserais l'audace jusqu'à dire « les Québécois », mais on va se partager ça ici aujourd'hui. Nous autres, on sait jouer au hockey. Je dirais « vous autres », parce que moi, du tout. Dans mon enfance et dans l'enfance de centaines de milliers de Québécois de mon âge, tu faisais un but 
Tu étais Guy Lafleur, sauf à Drummondville, tu étais Yvan Cournoyer. Tu étais Ken Dryden. Ken Dryden, des noms qui font rêver les jeunes. Et quand on dit qu'on a les meilleurs joueurs du monde, rien ne le démontre mieux que la série du siècle. D'un côté, nous, incarnés par ces hommes que nous avons l'honneur de recevoir aujourd'hui, et de l'autre, la superpuissance soviétique. En pleine guerre froide, alors que planait au-dessus des têtes la menace nucléaire et la crainte d'une troisième guerre mondiale, c'est sur une glace que s'affrontaient les meilleurs d'entre nous et les meilleurs d'entre eux. Pete et Frank Marvlich, Marvlich, excusez, je l'ai pas dit depuis longtemps, <rire> Guy Lapointe, Yvan Cournoyer, Serge Savard, Ken Dryden, Phil et Tony Esposito, Bobby Clark, Roger Lurt, pour n'en nommer que quelques-uns. Et croyez-moi, ce n'est pas par manque d'admiration qu'on ne nomme pas toute l'équipe. Et de l'autre, l'Union soviétique, l'ennemi du Bloc de l'Ouest. Ceux-là de l'autre côté du rideau de fer. Ils ne pouvaient pas perdre. Ils ont perdu. On ne pouvait que gagner. Et on a gagné. Magique. La série du siècle symbolise tellement de choses. Tout d'abord, mieux vaut se battre sur la glace avec une rondelle et des bâtons que sur un champ de bataille. À cet égard, ce serait peut-être une bonne idée pour M. Poutine de lâcher l'Ukraine. On pourrait régler ça dans un 4 de 7. <rires> Ensuite, la série du siècle, du siècle nous a rappelé que les Soviétiques n'étaient pas seulement des ennemis. On avait des adversaires qu'on pouvait, et surtout qu'on devait respecter. Et c'est une contribution extraordinaire du sport dans la détente et l'éventuelle fin de la guerre froide. Une pierre du mur de Berlin est sans doute tombée avec la série du siècle. Enfin, M. le Président, le but de Paul Anderson. Paul Anderson qui a marqué le plus beau but de grandeur de l'histoire. Il y a la Joconde de Da Vinci. Il y a la neuvième symphonie de Beethoven. Et le but de Paul Anderson. Nation. Mon estimé collègue d'Abitibi et Miskaming suggère une série du 21e siècle. Une série où le Québec affronterait le Canada. <rire> équipe nationale et équipe nationale amicalement. Mais il y aura toujours des choses, de temps en temps, qu'on aura envie de faire ensemble. Et c'est pourquoi. 50 ans plus tard, nous sommes réunis pour vous dire bravo et merci. Merci pour le rêve et merci pour cette preuve que si on est suffisamment déterminé et courageux, on peut réussir des miracles. Merci, messieurs. Honorable député d'Algoma, Manitoulin, Kapuskasing. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to rise today to honor the 50th anniversary of the 1972 Summit Series and the team members that captured the hearts, minds, and imaginations of an entire nation. It is that rare event in sport that had every Canadian on the edge of their seat and would become legend across the nation creating role models, inspiring songs, and establishing Canada as the dominant hockey nation on Earth. Cette série était, est tellement emblématique qu'elle n'a pratiquement pas de rival en termes d'importance pour cette nation, à part du marathon de l'espoir de Terry Fox, et elle dépasse de loin des moments historiques du sport canadien, comme les deux championnats consécutifs des Blue Jays, le sprint de Donovan Bailey pour la médaille d'or et le but en hors de Sidney Crosby aux Jeux olympiques de Vancouver. Monsieur le Président, j'aimerais commencer par remercier tous les joueurs d'équipe Canada de 1972 pour leur victoire historique dans la série Canada-Russie, y compris les nombreux joueurs qui se sont joints à nous aujourd'hui pour célébrer ce 50e anniversaire. 
Mr. Speaker, in case you didn't know, a good lot of the players originated from Northern Ontario. <laughs> the, the Esposito brothers, Phil and Tony, learned to play in Sault Ste. Marie. Brothers Frank and Peter Mahovlich were from Schumacher. I was told not Timmins, but Schumacher. <laughs> Mickey Redman called Kirkland Lake home. Gary Bergman hailed from Kenora. And I also want to give a special shout out to the late, great Jean-Paul J.P. Perizet, the hard-working left winger from Smooth Rock Falls in my riding of Algoma, Manitoulin, Capus Casing, who scored two goals, two assists, and had the single most controversial moment in the series. But more on that in a minute. <laughs> the series is often spoken of as a parable of the Cold War these days, but I doubt that anyone playing in the series was thinking of that. The players went out there for eight games and through grit and determination brought this historic win home for our great nation. They inspired a generation of young people to embrace hockey and did so much to establish it as Canada's national sport to the extent that this House legally declared it as such in 1994. It's the historic moments that will be remembered forever across Canada. To quote commentator Foster Hewitt's play-by-play -play at the end of Game 8 of the series. Kulnoye has it on that wing. Here's a shot. Henderson made a wild stab for it and fell. Here's another shot right in front. They score! <laughs> Henderson has scored for Canada! <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Paul Henderson's iconic Game 8 winning goal, often called the goal of the century, will always live on as part of the Canadian psyche. Phil Esposito's seven goals and six assi assists set the pace for the entire series. And of course, J.P. Perisay's frustration at the officiating in Game 8 that got him ejected for game misconduct, which is often cited as the turning point that led to less questionable calls on the ice and strengthened the rest of the team's resolve. Je suis fier de dire qu'à la suite d'une récente inauguration, Le nom de Parisé est commémoré de façon permanente par une enseigne dans sa ville natale de Smooth Rock Falls, grâce à la suggestion de Johnny Lemieux et au soutien du conseil municipal. Ceux-ci voulaient s'assurer de bien rendre hommage à JP, tout en marquant le 50e anniversaire de la série de sommets de 1972. Monsieur le Président, Parisé a été ému d'être sélectionné pour représenter le Canada sur la scène mondiale Mais il était si respecté dans la Ligue nationale de hockey qu'on lui a demandé de jouer pour l'équipe du Canada en tant que choix surprise. Il a poursuivi une carrière de hockey exemplaire, jouant 890 matchs dans la Ligue nationale de hockey, dont deux matchs des étoiles. Il n'a jamais remporté la Coupe Stanley, mais sa veuve, Donna, a dit « Combien gagner l'or pour le Canada était si important pour lui? » I hope I was properly able to convey just how important this event was for the history of our nation. To quote the lyrics of another Canadian legend, and I'm not going to sing them because I can't do justice. Maybe the member for Tim and Jay Bisbee would have been able to do it, but not me. Uh, so from the tragically hip singer Gord Downey, if there's a goal that everyone remembers, it was back in old 72. We all squeezed the stick and we all pulled the trigger. And all I remember is sitting beside you. So, Mr. Speaker, I've also been lobbied by my colleague, the MP for Windsor West, to put in a selfless plug on having the, um, the, the member um, from the team, Paul Henderson, be, to be inducted in the Hockey Hall of Fame. And I was pleased to do that. Bravo. Mr. Speaker, Bravo. I thank you for your attention. And more importantly, I thank Team Canada from 1972 for all for this country. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Much has been said already about the Summit Series win, and to be honest, I was born more than a decade after <laughs> you won. And so I think I'll share more about the legacy that you left us. The first being this idea of a best on best tournament. If it wasn't for you at the Summit Series, would we ever have seen Gretzky pass to Lemieux to win the 1987 Canada Cup? Would we ever have seen Sid the Kid at the time score the golden goal 
in Vancouver 2010. That's part of the legacy that you all left for us. It's also in you all as players across the country that bring us such pride. And as we heard for Northern Ontario, I'll offer the same plug for Waterloo Region. <laughs> the late Bill Golds, uh, worthy from Waterloo. Rod Sealing from Elmira. And Don Ari from Kitchener. You make us all proud. <laughs> And last, of course, Mr. Paul Henderson. Not just the last goal, the game-winning goal in six, seven, and eight. And not just as a player, as a minister, as a motivational speaker, and as an author. Many Canadians have had the honor to meet Mr. Henderson over the years. In my case, I had that chance many years ago, introduced by his niece as Uncle Paul. What I remember most is how kind, gracious, and humble he was. In fact, he might be the only person in this country who doesn't think he believed he belongs in the Hockey Hall of Fame. <laughs> you brought together this country back in 1972 and you brought together this house in a spirit of unity today. Yeah. Your legacy. <laughs> Thank you for bringing pride to our country then and now. Thank you. Honourable colleagues, distinguished guests, hockey fans, and hockey legends. Le dernier mot, je le garde pour moi. Every Canadian baby boomer remembers that long day ago. Today's school children could not even imagine the excitement their grandparents felt about watching television during the school day at school. A few young people today would, would hardly recognize the then cutting-edge technology this massive box-like TV that were dragged into the classrooms and into the libraries so that we could all watch the game. Our excitement was all about the game, our game, Canada's game. Et pour plusieurs, le résultat de ce match entre le Canada et l'ex-union des républiques socialistes soviétiques avait aussi une importance géopolitique plus nuancé, plus compliqué. Mais tout le monde à travers le pays savait que nous étions en train de vivre un moment historique. C'était aussi un moment inspirant. Combien de nouveaux joueurs et sans doute de nouvelles joueuses ont chaussé des patins et sauté sur la glace après le but gagnant de Paul Henderson à la dernière minute de la partie. Sporting events make magic when they bring people together. And all of you made magic on the ice all those years ago. For that, we're all very grateful. It's now my pleasure to invite all honorable members to meet our special guests in the speaker's dining room, located behind chamber, the chamber in room 233S. I look forward to seeing you. Au plaisir de vous accueillir dans le Salon du Président, dans la pièce 233S de l'édifice de l'Ouest, pour une réception qui suivra immédiatement après la levée du comité plénier. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Miigwech. Le comité s'ajourne maintenant. <rires>